crew. Welcome back to the History of Pirates podcast. I'm your host, Craig Buddy. We're going to take a look at the basics. What is a pirate? They're seen as a scourge of the seas, and the universal enemy of all nations. I've always liked that one. It sounds pretty epic. They're evil and greedy men and women who steal what isn't rightfully theirs. A definition of pirate from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary states it as someone who attacks and steals from a ship at sea. Now, during the reign of King Henry VIII, he passed a law against piracy where the term pirate not only applies to robbery on the high seas, the fancy word for the international waters, but also to murders and felonies and robberies committed in any river, creek, haven, and any other place where the Lord High Admiral had jurisdiction. During certain times in our history, an empire may ignore the threat of piracy, where at other times an empire or empires may work together towards clearing out pirates from their waters. It seems that empires and governments don't see one or two pirate raids as a big deal. It's only when the government feels the financial hit and the decrease in trade that accompanies visits from pirates does it choose to act. Sometimes by then, as in the golden age of piracy, the number of pirates have increased exponentially, making the issue that much harder to deal with. Many times during the past, governments would choose to hire merchant captains, ships, and the crews to bolster their own navies during times of war. These were known as privateers and seen as legal pirates. These legal pirates would receive a letter of mark from the government official, or even a king, and be legally allowed to go to pirating. It's pretty much a contract between the owners of the vessel, the captain, crew, and the government, with an agreement that the government will collect a given percentage of the captured money and cargo. If the sailors were in short supply, it was common to force thousands of poor men from the cities to work and sail the ships. Maybe some of you can see the downside to this already. What the leading governments and powers of the day had essentially done was teach the skills and experience needed to sail, fight, and plunder, the three main ingredients to becoming a pirate, and they did this to thousands of men from every nation with a navy. It's not a big deal, though, since these sailors work for the governments, and as long as there are wars, they'll have jobs. When wars ended and countless numbers of sailors were out of employment, they only had a few options. One option would be to go in the merchant fleet, and another was to go in the Royal Navy. Now, the Royal Navy wasn't hiring during peacetime as much, and the merchant fleet had too many sailors to choose from. And plus, both options had low pay, if any were actually ever paid, and had brutal forms of punishment such as the cat of nine tails used to flog or whip an individual. we got to take a minute here and look at the cat of nine tails. It's a multi-tailed whip that originated as an implement for severe physical punishment, and that's exactly what it did. It was used in the Royal Navy and the Army of the United Kingdom. The captain would force the guilty crewman himself to make the whip by unbraiding and braiding rope strands together. They would be whipped repeatedly depending on the crime they had committed. At one point, they did create a formal regulated number of lashes per offense around 1755, but until then it was the captain's choice. On average, it was about 10, but if you were drunk on duty, you win the prize of 15 lashes. 50 would pretty much get you crippled, and 100 would pretty much kill you. You would get sliced deep, pretty quickly, hitting the bone and leaving big gashes. Now, keep in mind the captain had a lot of access to salt water from the ocean. It would be a shame if he was splashing that on the back of the sailor who disobeyed orders. It would also teach his friends watching, too. This punishment would be seen and heard by all aboard the ship, and was seen as a great way to keep the whole crew in check. They would sometimes use individual cat and nine tails, since using the same one on different people may pass and spread diseases through the blood contact and the open wounds on the back. Other times the captain didn't really care, though. They would hang the cat in a bag in the middle of the deck on the mast. The bag would most likely turn red from all the blood left on it and hang as a constant reminder to the crew of who was really in charge. The term, let the cat out of the bag, was nothing a crewman wanted to hear the captain say. When the captain did decide to take the infamous cat out of the bag, the crewmen that weren't being flogged would have to watch, and would do so in absolute silence. Almost as if a cat had their tongue. At least that's what the captains joked, saying this to the crews as they watched. And since the captain himself didn't or wouldn't get his hands dirty with such a task, he'd need willing crewmen to flog the sailor for him. The crew would make agreements between themselves to hit hard enough to make a noise, leave a scratch, but not break the skin or go too deep. They'd agree that if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Now, I can guess what some of you are thinking. Yeah, I don't think I want to join the Royal Navy, Craig, buddy. I'd rather not. Turns out that you may not even have a choice tomorrow to join at all. We'll learn a lot more about these press gangs, but for now, 
Imagine a group of people legally authorized to use whatever means needed to recruit men between 18 and 55 to join the Navy, and they were very good at it. I'll give you an example of how good they were. It was English law that if a man accepts the king's shillings, about 12 pennies, from a naval representative for the first month's pay, he was instantly enlisted. No take-backs, no reversals, nada. The thing is, the recruit himself would sometimes be totally in the dark to this agreement until it was too late. Sounds dumb, right? Because if you don't accept the money, you don't go to the Navy. It's that easy. Well, yes and no. Unless you can get the sailor drunk. Imagine if a sailor was at a pub and meets a really friendly barmaid or bartender and keeps being given free drinks to the sailor and all his friends. Now that he's really drunk, he gets a special drink delivered by the bartender and again, free and paid for. How nice. But really, it's been paid for by the scary looking guy standing with his friends in the corner. But the sailor has no idea of that yet. But a free drink is a free drink, so why not, right? So he drinks, and only then does he look down after hearing a in the tankard. That looks like a king shilling to me, is what I'd guess some helpful friend of the scary-looking guy may point out. And since the sailor accepted the drink, and everything inside the drink, he just joined the Navy. Pretty sneaky and works like a charm. For a while. Here's an interesting trivia uh, you can bore your friends with. Have you ever seen the tankards with the lids on them and the glass bottoms? Ever wonder why they need a lid? Were they really that bad at spilling drinks? And why would they want to look at what may or may not be at the bottom of the glass? Maybe to stop someone from dropping some cash money in the drink? And at least if they did, a savvy customer can check through the glass bottom. So with all the fun and excitement we've talked about in the Royal Navy and the merchant fleets, the only other option many sailors chose was to go out of pirating and go on the account with a pirate captain and crew. This option would allow him more freedom, increase in pay, keep in mind equal shares were common on a pirate ship and were written into most pirate articles, and the adventure of exploring far-off places of the known world. And with the Caribbean as a backdrop, all those warm waters and tropical islands, it only helps to give them more reason to go forth and pirate. Now, a corsair is an anglicized French term for a privateer, and later came to identify with the Mediterranean pirates instead of just privateers. Now, buccaneers refer to the English, Dutch, and French game hunters living on the island of Hispaniola, modern-day Dominican Republic, and Haiti during the 17th century. They learned their survival and cooking skills from the natives, such as the Arawak Indians, and used it to great success. The original buccaneers, being mainly French, lived off pigs and cattle living in the valleys. They would use a drying smokehouse called a boucan or boucan to preserve the meat. Think of it like a three-sided hut with a roof and a grill that the strips would be placed on to dry, making what we would call beef jerky. When they'd go out to trade with the British, French, and Dutch, they'd normally smell like these smoked meats and were nicknamed buccaneers after the smokehouse. This is how the term buccaneers originated. With the cat out of the bag, so to speak, more naval deserters made it to the buccaneer camps. And along with the escaped criminals and slaves, refugees, shipwreck survivors, political outcasts, all making Hispaniola their new home, they became an ever-increasing problem for honest trade, especially the Spanish. They had such a hatred for the Spanish and had the main goal of preying on the Spanish shipping and settlements whenever they could. The French also used the words filibuster and freebooter to refer to buccaneers as well. A swashbuckler originally referred to the 16th century armed brigands, and then it morphed into the 17th century swordsmen, where it was picked up in the 20th century fiction writers and passed along to Hollywood, where it's used to describe a pirate-type movie. So that's the basics covered of what is a pirate, and all the other terms used to designate those who, in one way or another, were out of pirating, even if legally. I think we can end here today. Next time we'll take a look at the ancient pirates of the Mediterranean, known generally as the Sea Peoples, and the response of the powers of the day to their activities. I'll be adding books, website, and article links for most episodes so you can learn more about the topic we cover on the website. I'm working on a pirate timeline, which we will add to as we go, and as well as uh, maps and photos, we'll be talking about biographies of VIPs, uh, very important pirates, and anything else related to pirates. Remember to follow the Facebook page at the History of Pirates podcast and join the discussion group, the crew of the History of Pirates podcast, if you want to throw out topics to cover and chat with the crew. You can rate the podcast if you feel like it on iTunes and toss a review if you're so inclined. 
It'll help the podcast get its foot in the door and build a little traction. Last of all, I want to give a thanks to a few people who helped me get this far. If you don't really want to hear about this, I understand. You can hop ahead to the next episode, Ancient Pirates and the Quest for Stuff. Until then, have a good night, crew. Hey crew, thanks for sticking around. So first of all, I want to thank my girlfriend Sarah for letting me talk her off about pirates a lot more than I normally do. Now, a big shout out to my family, my parents, and my stepdad. Uh, Dave's is technical whiz behind me actually getting this up on the interweb for you guys to hear. Uh, to the podcasters who have inspired me to do something, give me guidance and advice, and led the way before I even knew what a podcast was. Uh, Cameron Riley and Ray Harris Jr. from the Life of Caesar podcast, as well as the Napoleon podcast and World War II podcast separately. Uh, Rob Monaco from the Podcast History of Our World, Jordan Harbour from the Twilight Histories Podcast, uh, Nick Cross from the Geeked on History Podcast. Uh, you guys have all been great in helping me understand how to create something like this. Uh, now to the couple of the other people that I've listened to for years, uh, other than Cameron and, and Ray, uh, you've got uh, Mike Duncan's The History of Rome, which is legendary, uh, Matt's Today in History, which is awesome and uh along with the napoleon podcast was one of the reasons why i was able to do uh 12 hour shifts at a factory making blackberries you've also got a uh, dan carlin and jamie redfern uh, amazing amazing podcasters some of my new favorites uh daniel and greg from the lesser bonapartes they have an interesting podcast and you can tell they're really having fun while talking history now they're new to the game but they've already released a lot of great podcast episodes there's a sweet set of four podcasts covering the fall of the Bronze Age societies, and you'll actually get to see the Sea Peoples in different ways that I wouldn't be covering, and uh, how the empires dealt with them. A few more I can think of is the, the Maritime History Podcast by Brandon Hubner. Uh, it's good. It's got about five episodes so far, and it'll be a good uh, brother podcast for the History of Pirates podcast. You'll be able to see different aspects I may not cover. Uh, there's the Egyptian History Podcast, which is really sweet. And uh, the only one I can think of, which isn't really history, but it's been one of my favorites for years, is the Mysterious Universe podcast. It covers everything, and it's one of a kind. Last but not least, I want to thank the current History of Pirates podcast crew. I've already assembled on the Facebook group page. Gareth, Kathy, Suzuki, being some of the first members, welcome aboard. Glad to have you all with us. And one last thanks to the History Podcast group online. Uh, you guys have always been great, and it's an awesome, awesome community. Keep it up, and thanks again to everybody who's helping me out. Let's have some fun, keep your hands inside the boat, and let's keep an eye out for the Navy. We're going to go out of pirating.